Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be looking at a type of soldier that has a very important but often exaggerated role in Napoleonic warfare and wargaming, uh, the light infantry. Now before we start and get into the meat and potatoes of this video, I think it's important to define what I actually mean when I'm talking about light infantry in this video. And it's more really about how they operate on the battlefield. So for the purposes of this video, when I mention light infantry, what I'm talking about are troops who operated in very loose order or skirmish order, one could say, as opposed to the sort of ranks and files that we traditionally associate with Napoleonic warfare. So the reason that I think it's important that we define this and make this distinction early on is that there were units in Napoleonic armies, especially the British and French armies, that were called light infantry so you might have the leger of the uh, the french army or uh, for instance the ox and bucks light infantry or or you know the durham light infantry in the british army but they usually operated pretty much like their line equivalent so they their light infantry status was pretty much in name only by this point so those of you who've seen my napoleonic basics french infantry video well, know that in that video, I pretty much lumped Line and Leger together in one video. And that's for that reason. That's because that by the time of the Empire, certainly, Light and Line Infantry were pretty much you know interchangeable terms. I think the Light Infantry probably thought themselves a cut above the Line Infantry. But whether that's true or not, I'm, I don't really know. So, when we're talking about um, Light Infantry today we'll be covering troops that fought in skirmish order, uh, often with you know five or six yards between each man. They usually operated in pairs, but we'll get more into that as the video goes on. So having talked about the uh, fact that you know light infantry units weren't always fighting entirely in skirmish order, there were actually units that did do that across all Napoleonic armies. That's not to say that they never fought in close order, but the vast majority of the time they would be in the skirmish order. And I think units that are, you know, best exemplify this would be the Jaegers in European armies in uh, Prussia, Austria, and the Russians all used uh, units called Jaegers. You've obviously got the, uh, the, the famous rifles for the British, both the 95th rifles and the 60th Royal American rifles. And then you've also got uh, skirmishing troops in less major powers so the portuguese uh, had their catadores and i apologize if i'm uh, slaughtering that pronunciation but uh, i think we're probably used to that uh, slaughtering of foreign languages by me by now uh, and also i want to talk at the end of the video about a special type of unit that the austrians had a unit called grenzer and when i'll be discussing that i'll be discussing their enemies as well and it's something that we've never discussed on the channel before, so I'm quite looking forward to that. We'll be discussing some troops from the Ottoman Empire. So what was the use of light infantry? Why did Napoleonic armies employ troops that fought in skirmish formation? Well, I mean, I think really to start answering the question, we need to go back to almost the very dawn of warfare. Um, you know, back to the mists of time and the Bronze Age even. Uh, where they had units of light infantry called chariot runners. And it's not 100% known what chariot runners did, but they would uh, follow the chariots around, as the name suggests, and it was suggested they would perhaps finish off people wounded by the nobility, dart in and out, things like that. I think another potential use of them, and this uh, goes more to the Napoleonic side of it, is that they would disrupt the enemy. And that's certainly what light infantry did later on so you'll have troops like the peltasts in ancient greek armies or the velites or the velite i'm not entirely certain how that's pronounced in republican roman armies and uh, you also had you know hannibal using balearic slingers famous light troops like this and their role was very much to disrupt the enemy formations so in ancient warfare everything relies on you having a solid shield wall and if that can be, you know, disrupted by people being killed or injured in that wall just before your troops move in, then obviously it's going to make their job a lot easier. And I think that's really the um, 
That's really the raison d'etre of light troops. The idea is not that they're going to cause huge casualties, but they're going to disrupt the enemy. And that's why, certainly in the Napoleonic Wars, skirmishes were used for, and they were particularly effective in this role because of the way that armies at the time had their command and control structures very heavily based around the senior officers and, to a lesser extent, the senior NCOs of the units. So in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, a skirmish unit, and I'm very much talking here about those specialist skirmishing units, so let's say British Rifles or Austrian Jaegers as an example, they would usually operate in pairs, and that would allow one soldier to advance while the other one fired and perhaps reloaded, and then it would mean that of the pair, one of them was always loaded. This was particularly important in units that used rifles, because they took much longer to reload than a musket would. And this is quite a new concept in the Napoleonic Wars. Skirmish infantry had been used to an extent in the American War of Independence by both the British and French armies. They um, picked up a lot of extra tips from the Indian tribes that fought alongside them. So the uh, I, I, I always refer to them as woodland Indians as opposed to plains Indians. I'm, I'm sure that's not the uh, the proper term for them, but... Uh, anyone who's read or seen Last of the Mohicans knows uh, knows about that kind of thing. But in the American War of Independence, they were armed almost entirely with muskets. There would be, uh, certainly on the American side, there were riflemen, um, usually private uh, private weapons. But for the British, it was mostly musket armed, and that changed come the Napoleonic Wars. Not all light infantry units had rifles. But I, I, I think partly because of Sharp, obviously, and other reasons, the British Rifleman is almost quintessentially in, indicative of that era and that the idea of light infantry and skirmish warfare. Something that um, really sets a trooper of a light infantry unit apart from his line brethren is that they would be a lot more independent-minded. So there's a, a book I can highly, highly recommend is Mark Urban's Rifles, and obviously in that he's talking about the British Rifles. So I can understand if some people are sort of, you know, a bit wary of it, but I can highly recommend it, it's a very, very good read. And he talks about in there how a uh, an order went round all the units of the British Army saying, right, we're starting this new experimental corps of riflemen, so you are instructed to send all your best soldiers, I think it was about a dozen of your best soldiers, to make up this new corps of troops. Now, obviously, the colonels and the sergeant majors of these units didn't send their best. They sent the people who were troublemakers because it was a really, really good way of getting rid of them, basically. Um, But what that meant was that often the people who were the troublemakers, one of the reasons that they were causing trouble is they were a bit too independent thinking. Um, They kind of thought for themselves a bit too much, and that's what, it was a bit bolshy in the ranks. Fortunately, almost by accident, that's exactly what a light infantryman needed. He needed to be able to have that individual thinking because he wasn't surrounded by his colleagues with a sergeant behind him telling him when to fire and when to reload. It was a much more individual type of warfare. And I think it really uh, goes through to today's warfare where an infantryman is expected to be a lot more self-reliable than he would have been in the Napoleonic period. And this spirit was also very much in the continental rifle-armed units. Usually, I mean, the very name Jäger is a German word for hunter, and it would come about that the troops who made up those formations were often a lot less disciplined than the ones who made up the line troops. And by that, I don't mean that they were less trained or less capable, but they were, again, often allowed a lot more individual thought. And the people who made up these Jaeger regiments, especially in Prussia and Austria, maybe less so Russia, uh, would be people like huntsmen or um, game wardens, people who made a living with their rifles. You know, I mean, it wasn't until the mid-19th century that bears were finally um, eradicated from Germany and Austria. So, you know, these were people who would use their rifles as tools on an almost daily basis. They wouldn't be fighting bears every day, but they would have to be, you know, handy with these weapons, maybe shooting game, 
things like that. So they were very much more that individual fighter. So I, I think it's especially when we think of the Prussians, we think of them being a very well-drilled machine. Uh, but the Jaegers, I think, were maybe not so much that. They were a little bit more, like I said, like individual thinkers. And I think that's why, you know, certainly Sharp makes such a good hero for a Napoleonic setting, because he has that ability for individual thought that, for argument's sake, a grenadier uh, officer wouldn't necessarily have. So we've talked about uh, pretty much most of the Napoleonic powers. Uh, one that we is a glaring omission so far, especially when we've talked a lot about this, the importance of an individualistic spirit for these light infantry are the French. And it's quite an interesting sort of conundrum that the French army's got. As those of you who've seen my French infantry video will know, that the the idea of an individual's initiative was something that was seen as being very important in the French army. So that meant that pretty much all the units, particularly early on in the Republic period and the very early Empire, or 1805-1806, all units were supposed to be able to operate in skirmish order. And that meant that you they hugely outnumbered enemy skirmishers. And we'll get on to that in a bit uh, when we start talking about what the role of these skirmishers in a Napoleonic battlefield was. So it was good for them because it meant that they had this individual spirit. You could have any unit that you wanted could form skirmish order and they'd be good at it. But they weren't specialists. And because they weren't specialists, they weren't as good in skirmish order as the enemy specialists. There was just a lot more of them. It also meant that as the wars progressed and the quality of troops dropped, that this became more and more difficult. There's some suggestion that the attack column was basically designed because it's really good for poorly trained troops to go for. So while you've got the potential for any unit to be skirmishers, the downside of that is none of them are as good as their enemy counterparts. And as the quality of those troops dropped off, you saw less and less use of skirmish formation. And I think it's something that when we get to the end of the video, when we start discussing skirmishes in black powder, I think that's going to be something that is, is I would have as a minor criticism of the rules. The French were also not helped by the refusal of Napoleon to allow rifles to be issued to his troops. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk about rifles and their importance in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, as I said, you know, obviously we've got the British rifles and the Portuguese Catadores, uh, both directly equipped with Baker rifles. You would have also the Prussian, Austrian and Russian Jaegers, the majority of whom would be equipped with rifles. And they would be either their own pieces, so particularly for the Prussians you would have you know, an Indo a civilian rifle almost, uh, or they would be imported Baker rifles. The British, uh, almost like the Americans in World War Two, sent a huge amount of equipment over to their uh, coalition allies, and one of the most prized things there were Baker rifles. In fact, uh, it was a bit of a reward in the Russian army to be issued with a Baker rifle. It was sort of like having a marksman's lanyard, you would also get the best weapon, which at the time was a Baker rifle. So why was the rifle such an important weapon? Well, I think it's because it allows a soldier to fire aimed shots. Now, I'm aware that sounds a little bit weird. I mean, you know, of course soldiers fire aimed shots. But that's a very modern concept of uh, firing. And that's because soldiers today use rifles almost universally. So back in Napoleonic times, the idea of a volley of fire was to either have a single crashing volley which would decimate the enemy in one go. That was very much a Seven Years' War approach, and it's the one that the Prussians took forward in 1806. Or they would have something called platoon fire, which was sort of like a ripple effect up and down the line. So they'd start at the ends of each line, and the end guys would fire, then the guys to the inside of them would fire, then the guys inside them, and so on. So you get like a rolling effect there that moved towards the center of the unit. And um, these guys, you know, if you've ever been to a reenactment or you've seen Waterloo or something like that, you'll see there's an absolutely horrendous amount of smoke uh, 
that these muskets uh, produce. You can't see anything from them. And the idea isn't that you aim and fire with a musket. The idea is that you put out so much weight of fire that you hit the enemy. And it's it always surprises me when you read about the casualties of a battle. Not Waterloo. I think Waterloo was perhaps an exception to this. But many, many battles, you can be fighting for two or three days and you've got maybe five, six, seven, eight thousand casualties. It's uh, The casualties are surprisingly low compared to the Im- intensity of fighting. Obviously, as the war went on, then casualties would increase as the technology of the warfare also improved. Really, musket fire was not aimed, is, is the point I'm getting at. Whereas a rifle absolutely was aimed. And that makes it good for doing two things. Well, for doing the same thing well, but for two different reasons. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to pick a specific enemy soldier and fire at him. And that's good if the enemy soldier you're firing at is another skirmisher. Because, you know, if you miss him, you miss him. Whereas if it's he's in a column or a line of troops, if you miss the guy that who you're, air quote, aiming at, you'll probably hit the guy next to him or the guy behind him or even the guy three or four men away from him. But if he's in skirmish short, if you miss him, you miss him. Uh, and the other thing it's really good for is aiming at specific people in a battalion. And by this, I'm talking basically officers, standard bearers or eagle bearers, senior NCOs, people who were really responsible for the coordination of units on the Napoleonic battlefield. And by killing these people, you can really gain an advantage because the enemy suddenly is unsure of what to do. They become staggered. Uh, They become ripe for attacks from your cavalry or perhaps a volley and charge by your infantry. So by decapitating the enemy's command structure, can be a highly, highly effective way of swinging the momentum of a battlefield, particularly in the local area, so the area that's directly to the front of your battalion, basically. You can really swing that into your favour. So as I kind of hinted at a minute ago, the other role that a skirmisher would be able to do very well is fight enemy skirmishers. So if you the idea of a skirmisher is that they're going to snipe at your officers, well... You want to try and stop that, so you would send your skirmishers out to stop that happening. You know, and then maybe if you drive off the enemy skirmishers, you'll be able to snipe at their officers. So it becomes a little bit of a of a mini battle in between and before the main lines clash. And these skirmishers that would be protecting your battalion are uh, particularly a British and French thing, and they were so. Because British and French battalions both had light companies. So if you've seen the videos on the relevant uh, army infantry units. Then you'll know that the British had uh, one of their ten companies was a light company. The French it was one of their six companies. And they would be troops who were trained in this more individualistic sense. They probably wouldn't be as good as it as the absolute specialists. As the rifles or the catadores. But they would be better trained than maybe the line troops and probably better trained than your average French fusilier if they went into skirmish order. So those are what we call the light companies. They would do the role of the Jaegers, the rifles, etc. in front of their own battalions. They'd be trying to snipe enemy officers and they would be trying to stop their own officers being sniped. Of course, they would be using muskets though, not rifles. And while, you know, they'd be better than firing volleys at picking out individual targets, because you fire your musket, there's a big puff of smoke. Because you're on your own or you're in loose order, you can move either through the smoke or you can wait 10, 20 seconds for the smoke to clear while you reload your musket and fire again. You can do this almost with impunity because the enemy are not going to waste their volleys firing at skirmishes. Like we said earlier on, the idea of a volley is that it's just a sheer weight of fire. You're not really aiming to hit any one person in particular. And if you're a skirmisher, you can also be lying down or finding small like bits of cover, maybe the odd tree or rock to hide behind, those kind of things. So a volley against a skirmish screen would be an absolute no-no. It would be 
a sign of a very poor officer who either ordered that or allowed that to happen with his troops. So that meant that skirmishers were really only vulnerable to enemy skirmishers, or the other thing, and this was a real, real threat to them, would be cavalry, especially light cavalry, because they had the speed to catch them unawares. I've read at the Battle of Fuentes de Honoro, on the second day, the uh, rifles were covering the retreat of the, I think it was the 7th Division of the British Army, against a whole swarm of French dragoons. And what would happen is the uh, the units would form square with the uh, the rifles or the light infantry kind of skirmishing between them. When the cavalry got close, they would just run to the nearest square. Now, the, the square forms quite a solid block, so they couldn't force their way through. So they would just dive at the feet of the kneeling front rank of the square and just hope that the cavalry couldn't get close enough. And, you know, luckily or skillfully for the British on that day, None of their squares broke, so that was actually a very effective thing to there. But if skirmishes are caught by cavalry, then that's it's curtains for them. They're, in realistically, in any set of wargame rules, they should pretty much be removed from the table at that point. Okay, so we've talked about the units that were primarily for skirmish troops. Now, that's not to say that they always did. I think the British Rifles maybe formed close order in one of their battles. I have heard about that, but I've not heard any specifics. But a unit that could fight both in close order and loose order were an Austrian unit called Grenzer. Now they were raised from the southeastern borders of Austria, the border that uh, was against the Ottoman Empire. And they would often be fighting in border skirmishes in the mountains of the Balkans for, you know, just sort of local control really. Um, and for that reason it was important that they had formed troops um ottoman cavalry was uh, outdated but still very good um and they also had to go skirmish order to negotiate the terrain they were in and also because the balkan uh, ottoman troops were known as bashi basuks which i think is fantastic uh and they would be very much in loose order um almost like sort of roving bandits and the Bosnian Muslims and the Albanians were known to be some of the best troops of the Ottoman Empire. The Albanians in particular were considered to be the best troops of the Ottoman Empire by the Napoleonic period. And they fought very similarly to Spanish guerrillas, who I haven't really mentioned in today's video. I thought I'd save them for the end here. Um, very much in sort of roving gangs of bandits, almost. So an Albanian or a Bosnian Muslim... Uh, Bashi Basuk unit would, wouldn't would be necessarily be on the army's strength, it would be irregular, but they would operate almost in family units or in gangs. In the guerrillas, it would often be a village or you know a congregation or something like that. And by their very nature, they would fight as light infantry. They would fight in skirmish order because they weren't trained or drilled to fight in close order. Um, Often not particularly well equipped. The uh, the Albanians were not bad. They had jazails occasionally, but they would often just use uh, well rifles. Uh, rifles are quite um, quite popular down in that area of the world. Um, and the Grenzer were used when used against the French. They they were actually not bad. They um, because they could combine those two roles. They were quite flexible in the Austrian army, which doesn't really have that much flexibility. We talked about the light companies of the British and French units. The Austrians didn't have light companies. They had grenadier companies that would be detached to form combined grenadier battalions, but no light troops. So they were very vulnerable to enemy skirmishes. And that meant that you know units of Grenzers, uh, certainly at the Battle of Aspen Essling, there was uh, they tried to have a Grenzer unit per division. Now that didn't always work. But that's kind of what they went for. For they, they were very good at screening their own troops. A, a, an interesting unit, the Grenzers. I might do a video just based on them at some point. And certainly the Ottomans are a fascinating, fascinating army for the period. And that's definitely something I'd like to explore more in future videos. So this has been an absolute whistle-stop tour of light infantry units in the Napoleonic Wars. I think when I do individual units... Uh, videos i think we'll probably go into the 
individual units in a bit more <laughs> a bit more detail in those, I, I would imagine. The thing that I want to quickly end this video on is um, in black powder, how do light infantry work? Well, it's a it's a tough one. They're, I think they're not brilliantly represented in the rules. I think they have far too much chance of forming square if charged by cavalry. I think that if you have your light companies deployed, you're at minus one to be hit, which I don't mind. I think that sounds fairly reasonable because, again, like I was saying, that kind of affects the command and control of the enemy. So it's not only is it that they're having difficulty firing because they're being constantly stung by troops firing at them, but also that command and control element's not there. I do think in Black Powder there is a mechanic for loss of command and control, and that's the disorder mechanic. Now, I think there could be an argument for saying that light infantry, or perhaps even rifle-armed light infantry, cause disorder on a 5 or a 6. I think that would be far too strong. I think, I think that would be very overpowered. At the moment, they get sharpshooters, so they re-roll a miss. Which I don't mind. Unfortunately, I think it doesn't really portray them very well, because it it kind of I, I'm I'm aware that stamina doesn't necessarily just represent casualties, but that's very much a a large part of what it represents. And it turns rifle. I mean, the British rifles in particular. If you've seen it, any of my battle reports, you'll see that I love using my uh, my rifles. But it turns them into sort of death dealing machines, and I don't really think. That's where they're at their best. What I would probably go with is if you fire two or more dice, use different colored dice or use a different colored dice, and that specifically one dice causes disorder on a five or a six. So if you're a small unit of rifles and you throw two dice, three dice if you're first firing, use two whatever colored dice and one white colored dice, and the white one is causes disorder on a 5 or 6, and the other is just on a 6. That's something that I haven't tried yet, so it's something that I might be trying in the next game. I'd like to try and get a few more experimental rules in, so let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in seeing. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. We've gone on for nearly half an hour, which is far longer than I intended it to be, so uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and maybe leave a comment. I've certainly not exhausted everything there is to know about light infantry here if you didn't like the video then that's fine please let me know in the comments why and what you'd like to see in future videos um please like share and subscribe i've actually just started a twitter account for this um channel now i'm i'm i've never used twitter before so i don't really know what i'm doing with it but follow me on twitter i think is the uh, the way to do it and once again Thank you very much for choosing to spend the last half an hour with me, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.